morning. Welcome to the session on using measurement and data to end homelessness. Now this will be a, ses a bilingual session in Spanish and English. Um, each of you has headphones and a little transmitter at your spot. And um, it is, uh, is it number one? Number one. If you have it on number one, um, you will be able to hear the translation that is most appropriate for you. And uh, we will take a little break. The first speaker is going to be speaking in Spanish, and then the second two speakers will be speaking in English. So we will take uh, just a moment to allow you to get that going when the time is right. Um, so it gives me great pleasure this morning to introduce our three speakers. The first is Maya Aldama, and she is from Montevideo, Uruguay. No, I didn't say that very well. It's okay. It's okay. Montevideo. It's okay. Montev Montevideo. I was practicing too. It's a struggle. It's a struggle. Um, she is the director of comprehensive protection with the Ministry of Social Development. And um, Maya has been working on the plan of attention of social emergencies, and later she worked on the equity plan that was developed um, in 2008. And um, since then, her responsibilities have been for programs related to homelessness, transfers, and monetary and family accompaniment. We also have Kimberly Schmidt. Kimberly is from right here in Chicago at the organization I work for, All Chicago, where she is the Systems Implementation and Training Manager. And she has been working on building a comprehensive system for data collection and housing. And specifically, she's going to be talking about the framework that's been developed for ending veterans homelessness and chronic homeless initiatives in Chicago. And thirdly, we have Volker Bush Gertzema. Uh, <laughs> um, he is from Germany and um, he is a professor and senior research fellow at the Association of Innovative Social Research and Social Planning. And he is a member of the European Observatory on Homelessness. He's the coordinator of the observatory and a member of the editorial team of the European Journal of Homelessness. And he's also been doing some work with IGH on looking at homelessness on a global scale. So please join me in welcoming our three speakers this morning. Each speaker will be speaking for 20 minutes and then we will have questions at the end. But I will take a moment as they set up their different PowerPoints, just in case, in case there are any clarifying questions that anyone has. Maya, the room is yours. Okay, whoa. <coughs> bueno, buenos días a todos, a todos. Muchas gracias a, al Instituto por invitarnos eh, y a, a Isabel que nos hizo también llegar la invitación a Isabel de Chile que nos hizo llegar la invitación al taller en el que participamos el sábado sobre las ciudades vanguardias y quiero decir además que todo lo que diga si es útil o no es responsabilidad de Volker que tuvo la maravillosa idea de que nosotros viniéramos hasta aquí a contar nuestra experiencia así que si esto resulta aburrido todas las quejas son para Volker nos parece, eh, antes de contar un poquito, este, de escribir cuál es el, el proceso de fortalecimiento que hemos hecho del abordaje de la situación en calle, a partir de los aportes que nos ha brindado la medición de personas en situación de calle, nos parecía importante compartir algunas claves acerca de cómo pensamos la situación de calle y pido disculpas a quienes participaron del taller del Estado porque puedo ser reiterativa en algunas de las cosas que voy a decir. Pero me parece importante compartirlas porque América Latina tiene enclaves particulares para pensar los problemas de la exclusión social y siempre es bueno recordar cuáles son esos enclaves, por lo menos para nosotros. Entonces, primero, un muy breve comentario sobre la protección social y la desigualdad, porque nosotros entendemos que la problemática de las personas en situación de calle o el sinogarismo es un problema absolutamente asociado a la protección social y a la, la capacidad de la protección social y un problema derivado de la desigualdad. 
al menos así en América Latina, al menos así en el Uruguay. Entonces, decirles que yo vengo del continente más desigual del mundo. Durante los años 70 las dictaduras cívico-militares instalaron gobiernos de orientación neoliberal que aniquilaron las bases de la protección social que la lucha de los trabajadores había conseguido en la primera mitad del siglo XX. En el Uruguay, luego de eso, una crisis socioeconómica. Habiendo terminado la, la dictadura cívico-militar en 1984 y dándose continuidad a las políticas neoliberales y conservadoras, una crisis socioeconómica, consecuencia de la aplicación de esas políticas neoliberales, afectó a la población en el año 2002, dejando 40% de pobreza en la población y 50% de pobreza en los niños. A partir del año 2005, por primera vez un partido político de izquierda con orientación redistributiva ha accedido al gobierno. Se ha trabajado, quizás conocen algunos de los presidentes que pasaron por Uruguay, Tabaré Vázquez, en general el más conocido José Mujica, hoy actualmente nuevamente es presidente Tabaré Vázquez. Se ha trabajado para reconstruir la protección social en la concepción de que la garantía de derechos es primero que nada una responsabilidad del Estado y esa responsabilidad no puede ser abandonada ni al mercado ni a la voluntad privada. Decíamos el otro día, me parece muy interesante una frase de Juliana Martínez que es una politóloga uruguaya que trabaja en Costa Rica y ha desarrollado mucha investigación sobre los sistemas de protección social en América Latina que si hay algo que Europa tiene para aprender de América Latina es lo que le pasa a las personas cuando el Estado las deja solas frente a los mecanismos de exclusión del capitalismo. Habiendo dicho todo eso, que es el contexto del cual partimos y a partir del cual hemos venido trabajando en el desarrollo de la matriz de protección social, vamos a hablar de la situación de calle en el Uruguay y que, por qué para nosotros es importante generar investigación y tener medición de la problemática. Allí, allí está Uruguay, un país pequeño entre dos gigantes, América y eh, Argentina, y Brasil, nuestra capital, es Montevideo y es esa ciudad que está más al sur. Eso es Montevideo, la rambla de Montevideo. Hago promoción de turismo, cuando quieran pueden ir a visitar Montevideo. Uruguay tiene una población de 3.286.314 personas y una superficie de 176.215 kilómetros cuadrados. La mayoría de la población se concentra en las, eh, las ciudades. Su capital, Montevideo, concentra el 40% de la población. Luego, la pobreza se redujo sustancialmente en los últimos 12 años, como les contaba. Luego de alcanzar el 40% de las personas en 2005, pasó a estar en el 9,4% en el año 2016, el año pasado. Ella es una gráfica que muestra el descenso de la pobreza entre los años 96 y 2013. Ustedes van a ver que en los años 90 hay un descenso de la pobreza, pero ese descenso de la pobreza no fue acompañado de una disminución de la desigualdad. Por el contrario, bajó la pobreza, pero se acrecentó la desigualdad. Luego hay un aumento de la pobreza muy importante, allí llegamos a la crisis que les relate, y luego esa disminución de la pobreza, que en, esta, en este periodo histórico sí fue acompañado de un proceso de disminución de la desigualdad. Este proceso, la pobreza extrema hoy es este, monetaria, es muy pequeña, es del 4,5 al 0,3, pero es importante decir que estos son datos de medición de pobreza por ingresos y que hay condiciones sí, estructurales y en particular vinculadas a la pobreza y en particular el acceso a la vivienda que sigue siendo un tema de trabajo eh, de agenda política y de trabajo del Estado, porque ahí permanecen condiciones estructurales de exclusión social, de las cuales además no son diferentes al resto de los países de Latinoamérica, donde la fragmentación territorial de la pobreza eh, imprime una fuerte desintegración social también. Estos son agenda de trabajo también. ¿Por qué hablamos de vivienda y de exclusión socio-habitacional? Socio porque para nosotros la situación de calle forma parte de un proceso, de, un proceso de exclusión socio-habitacional y entonces comprender la situación de calle también es comprender el resto de los déficits de vivienda, de acceso a la vivienda que tiene el resto de la población, que quizás no se encuentra en la calle, pero que también puede estar siendo excluida del acceso al derecho a la vivienda. 
en el, mar, en el marco de la, la creación o, o el fortalecimiento del sistema de protección social, como decía, como concibiendo al Estado con el deber de garantizar el derecho de las personas, en el año 2005 se genera un sistema de atención a personas en situación de calle que ha ido creciendo y que hoy tiene un programa específico que le llamamos calle, que atiende a los adultos solos, varones y mujeres, un programa de cuidados, que el Uruguay además está generando un sistema de atención a un sistema integral de cuidados, pero este es un, son servicios de cuidado específicos para personas que se encuentran viviendo en la intemperie y un programa de atención a mujeres con niñas, niñas y adolescentes que están o podrían estar en situación de calle si no fueran a los albergues. Luego el sistema de atención a personas en situación de calle tiene estos tres programas que tienen básicamente modalidades de albergues colectivos, refugios y tiene dispositivos de captación y derivación. Esos dispositivos trabajan con las personas que están a la intemperie. Son equipos técnicos interdisciplinarios que se dirigen a la eh, intervención con las personas que están a la intemperie. Ahí con dos, con dos finalidades. Una sí es que las personas se acerquen a los servicios, o sea, ingresen a los refugios, pero luego también con una finalidad de abordaje este, sostenido, de intervención social sostenida para aquellas personas que desisten, no quieren venir a los refugios, pero donde nosotros entendemos que hay que seguir trabajando. El, en general... Les eh, bueno, decir que siempre que se toma contacto con una persona en situación de calle, el trabajo no termina cuando la persona dice que no quiere venir al refugio, sino que ahí empieza el trabajo. Este sistema de atención a personas en situación de calle ha crecido mucho en los últimos, para la dimensión que tiene el Uruguay, para la dimensión que tiene Montevideo. Está básicamente, sus servicios están centrados en la capital, en Montevideo, y pasó de tener 280 cupos de atención en cinco centros en el 2005, hoy tiene 1.727 cupos de atención, en 53 centros de alojamiento colectivo en el 2017, actualmente. Información, para no abundar sobre el sistema, porque podríamos hablar largamente capaz sobre cuáles son este, las tareas o los objetivos que tienen los dispositivos de atención o los refugios, y el trabajo en, con, la, por, con la población en situación de calle, sí decirles antes que nosotros definimos a la población de calle para, para, para la definición de la población objetivo de, esta, de estos servicios como aquellas personas que permanecen a la intemperie. Las personas eh, en, en situación de calle están definidas eh, en estos servicios como aquellas personas que viven a la intemperie. Y para nosotros esto es importante definirlo por esto que decíamos, en un contexto donde el, el acceso al derecho a la vivienda tiene sus complejidades y la vivienda estructuralmente tiene sus complejidades, como en, en otros países de Latinoamérica, eh, y es muy importante definir cuál es la población que atendemos. Son aquellas personas que viven en la intemperie, porque hay otras personas que viven en hábitats degradados, en condiciones sociohabitacionales insuficientes, etcétera, que no tienen los servicios básicos, pero no son las, esas personas no vienen a estos centros. Esas, esas familias y esas personas son sujetos de otras políticas, de políticas de desarrollo habitacional. Bueno, información para el diseño y la gestión. ¿Dónde hemos hecho más énfasis? En el, contamos con un sistema informático online de gestión de los cupos, de los lugares en los centros y de registro de algunos datos de los usuarios que eh, son derivados a esos centros. Las personas llegan a un único lugar del centro de derivación y de allí son, de acuerdo al perfil este, que tienen, son derivados a diferentes centros. Allí hay un sistema informático de registro online que hace un registro de las características básicas de las personas y los lugares donde son de, este, derivados. Luego estamos atravesando un proceso de fortalecimiento de ese sistema de registro para conocer, cuando tomamos contacto con las personas, la trayectoria de las personas dentro de los centros de atención y poder conocer cuál es la intervención, cómo, cuál es la incidencia que tiene nuestra intervención en la trayectoria e inclusión social de las personas. Para eso estamos trabajando en mejorar el sistema de registro. Por otro lado, eso nos sirve como un insumo para el monitoreo de los programas. Nosotros tenemos supervisión financiera contable, de los, de financiera administrativa de los refugios, pero también tenemos de todos los dispositivos una supervisión técnica que se ocupa de hacer una, un seguimiento a esos equipos. Todos los refugios son implementados por organizaciones de la sociedad civil en acuerdo con el Estado y todos los fondos son del Estado, son financiados por el Estado. 
Luego tenemos un sistema de registro y georreferenciación de intervenciones a la intemperie. Aquí un equipo técnico, el equipo técnico móvil que trabaja, ya sea porque la ciudadanía llama un call center y nos dice dónde puede haber personas en situación de calle, o ya sea porque hace recorridas, registra y georreferencia dónde encuentra las personas y eh, eh, registra los datos más importantes de cada una de las intervenciones que tiene con las personas. Y finalmente, hemos eh, desarrollado hemos desarrollado censos y conteos en, eh, de personas en situación de calle. ¿Para qué todo este esfuerzo de conocer la problemática? No puede ser por, me, por simples, y creo que todos vamos a estar de acuerdo aquí, por simples aspiraciones contemplativas de un problema. ¿no? La información debe ser para producir transformaciones que mejoren el acceso al derecho a las personas, y entonces toda esta información que hemos producido y el esfuerzo de generar sistemas de registro, que siempre es un esfuerzo para que, para nosotros los informáticos a veces son amigos y a veces enemigos, siempre ese diálogo difícil entre este, nuestras, nuestros conocimientos sobre la intervención y la capacidad de desarrollar sistemas que lleva a ese diálogo inter, interdisciplinario que en general las disciplinas y los trabajadores sociales, los psicólogos, los antropólogos estamos muy este, de ese, tenemos un conocimiento muy desarrollado de las capacidades de los sistemas informáticos y a veces nuestros colegas los informáticos tampoco están muy capacitados y muy sensibles con poder desarrollar ese es un trabajo que hemos ido haciendo cotidianamente para que efectivamente todos estos sistemas puedan ser desarrollados y sean útiles para nosotros y sean útiles sobre todo para visibilizar los desafíos programáticos y metodológicos que tiene la intervención para las personas en situación de calle y que tiene la agenda política de gobierno para poder llevar adelante las acciones de protección. El, censo, censo, el último censo de población en situación de calle, les voy a contar brevemente qué hicimos y para qué nos sirvió. Hicimos un censo para conocer las características y trayectoria de la población en situación de calle para reorientar la definición de política. Y entonces allí lo que buscamos fue la trayectoria y la experiencia en calle de las personas, su trabajo, su educación, su salud, el consumo problemático, las redes vinculares, la su historia de institucionalización. Luego buscamos dar cuenta de la evolución del fenómeno Montevideo. Se partió de un acumulado de dos experiencias anteriores, la del 2006 y la del 2011, para poder tener algunos datos de comparabilidad sobre cómo se viene manifestando la, la situación de calle o la vida de las personas en intemperie en Montevideo y luego poder construir una línea de base para futuros estudios en realidad este censo, los anteriores también, pero sobre todo este último es una, una gran base de datos que, ha, que permite ahora profundizar y hacer otros cruces este, de hecho hay otros investigadores que eh, han solicitado poder hacer investigaciones con esa base de datos eh, entonces, ahí tenemos una, una posibilidad incluso de seguir profundizando la investigación sobre la trayectoria de las personas en situación de calle. Algunos resultados del censo. El censo contó en Montevideo, 505, salimos, primero contarles que esa noche eh, del año pasado, junio del año pasado, eh, salieron 200 personas, 200 voluntarios en Montevideo, algunos trabajadores trabajadores del Ministerio de Desarrollo Social, pero que no trabajan todos en situación de calle. Allí salieron desde los informáticos hasta los sociólogos, los psicólogos, los trabajadores sociales, los administrativos y los contadores. Hicimos una, una capacitación para todos ellos y en una sola noche salieron 200 personas a recorrer Montevideo. Para eso se solaparon, para armar las recorridas, eh, se solaparon muchas bases de datos, las bases de datos nuestras, de donde encontramos personas en situación de calle, las bases de datos que nos acerca la ciudadanía, las bases de datos de la policía, las bases de datos de los servicios de salud, etcétera, etcétera. Así se armó un paneo muy importante de Montevideo y se encontraron 556 personas pernoctando a la intemperie y 1095 personas que esa misma noche durmieron en los refugios. Adultos. La variación global de la población en calle entre el 2006 y 2011 es del 53%. La población en calle aumentó el 53%. Sin embargo, aumentó mucho más adentro de los refugios que lo que aumentó a la intemperie. Esto para nosotros es una buena, una buena y una mala noticia, ahora después se las cuento. Encontramos una población altamente masculinizada, 8 de cada 10 son varones, ojo acá, que 2 de cada 10 sean mujeres, para nosotros siempre es un peligro que las mujeres quedan, ayer el de otro día se hablaba de eso este, con, con las colegas de, de, de Puerto Rico, porque acá este, siempre hay que 
prestar especial atención a que las mujeres no queden invisibilizadas, aunque sean menos que no queden invisibilizadas, porque son mucho más dañadas, mucho más excluidas y mucho más vulneradas en la situación de calle. De todos modos, sí, hay una población altamente masculinizada en calle, con en, en una presencia muy fuerte de varones en calle en Montevideo, 8 de cada 10 son varones. Más del 85% no supera los 9 años de educación formal, más de, eh, cerca del 70% declara trabajar en trabajos informales sin protección social, sin acceso a la protección social. Trabajo, todos los que, mayoritariamente casi todos los que trabajan, trabajan, pero en trabajos precarios y de baja remuneración. Y en lo referido a la trayectoria de calle, se observa que uno de cada dos declara tener una tra trayectoria de calle menor al año. Sin embargo, también hay un número importante de personas que están hace más de cinco años en calle. El 80% de los entrevistados declara consumo de algún tipo de sustancias, las más consumidas eh, son el alcohol y la pasta base, es similar al crack, similar, es lo mismo, similar al crack, eh, o al pago en Argentina, seguidos por la marihuana el 40%. El 60% de los que consumen, consumen diariamente alguna de estas sustancias. En lo que refiere a institucionalización y conflicto con la ley, 4 de cada 10 declara haber estado privado de libertad en algún momento de su vida, o cuando era menor o siendo mayor de edad. 3 de cada 10 estuvo institucionalizado en el INAU. Disculpen, el INAU es Instituto del Niño y Adolescente del Uruguay. Esto quiere decir que son 3 de cada 10 vivieron en hogares de amparo, privados del cuidado familiar, internados en, en hogares de amparo, privados del, del, del cuidado familiar. Y dos, por lo menos en algún momento de su vida, no quiere decir que hayan estado siempre privados, pero en algún momento estuvieron privados del cuidado familiar. Y dos de cada diez estuvieron en tarlos e instituciones psiquiátricas. Considerando la trayectoria de los entrevistados por instituciones totales, como la cárcel, la institución psiquiátrica o los, o los centros de cuidados para niños, se observa que algo más de seis de cada diez han vivido al menos un episodio de institucionalización. Ya termino. ¿Para qué sirve esto? Para nosotros. El fenómeno de la población en calle muestra en términos cuantitativos que es una problemática de una magnitud abordable. Cuando uno coloca esto en la agenda política, alguien puede decir rápidamente, en Montevideo podría decirlo, se trata, estamos hablando de 500 personas, de 526 personas. Es, 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 eso es un número que parece abordable. Lo que sucede aquí es que supone una altísima complejidad el abordaje, el abordaje de, de cada una de las situaciones por las que atravesaron estas personas y el proceso de restitución de derechos hacia estas personas. Los datos relevados dan cuenta que es imprescindible desarrollar estrategias de coordinación de atención a la población en situación de calle, pero no solamente de coordinación de las instituciones. Para nosotros, habiendo visto esto, estos datos, de algún modo confirma que es cierto, se requiere más coordinación, pero también se requieren más prestaciones, se requiere materializar la política también. Lo decíamos el otro día y solemos ser bastante. Este, hacer esta prédica. Las personas en situación de exclusión, y en particular las personas en situación de calle, no necesitan solamente psicólogos y trabajadores sociales. Necesitan materialidad para acceder a sus derechos. Un trabajador social no sustituye una casa, un psicólogo no sustituye un modo de ingreso permanente, la protección social no se sustituye con la intervención psicosocial. Los programas de intervención con las. Exclusión social en América Latina, todos, y ahora hablo de las personas en situación de calle, pero hablo también de los programas de acompañamiento familiar con los cuales también trabajo, tienen el permanente riesgo de desmaterializar la política y tenemos que estar atentos desde los estados a eso. Sobre todo en contextos de crecimiento económico y disminución de la pobreza, donde puede pasar, alguien puede pensar que entonces hay unas cuantas personas que salieron de la pobreza y quienes permanecen en la pobreza lo que tienen son problemas conductuales. Eso es una tentación que lo que hace es individualizar un problema social y decir, bueno, si todos estos les fue bien ¿por qué todos estos quedaron acá abajo? es porque tienen un problema conductual y eso no es cierto, todos estos son parte de todos estos y en todo caso son la cara de la misma moneda entonces, para nosotros estos datos nos muestran que tenemos que materializar la política o sea, generar prestaciones nuevas, distintas y a veces con más inversión para restituir los derechos es más Además, y más, es, más, ponemos, es aún más relevante implementar acciones de prevención de la situación de calle. Porque 500 personas en situación de calle es una foto de un día. El problema más importante, siendo cada uno de ellos importante, es la máquina de producción de personas en situación de calle. En Uruguay hay 10.000 presos. Para nosotros eso es un número, 
de producción de la situación de exclusión socioeditacional. La mayoría de esos presos además son pobres porque el sistema penal es selectivo en todas partes del mundo y pena más a los pobres que a los no pobres. Entonces ese es un, es un proceso que si, si la cárcel y la institucionalización no se transforman, primero no se discuten. Primero hay que discutir si ese es un modo de intervenir sobre, sobre, la, sobre la exclusión y sobre los procesos de conflicto con la ley para nosotros. Pero luego si además no se transforman en instituciones que también trabajen la inserción social, la integración social, etc., son un lugar de donde se producen personas en situación de calle. Y eso hay que mirarlo con atención. Del mismo modo, trabajar acciones de prevención, esto nos llevó, nos llevó fuertemente a pensar que hay que trabajar acciones de prevención en, la, en el cuidado eh, sobre los niños que están privados del cuidado familiar. El Uruguay tiene 4.000 niños privados del cuidado familiar. Una prioridad de este periodo de gobierno para el Instituto Nacional de los Adultos, de, perdón, de los Niños y Adolescentes en el Uruguay es trabajar para la desinstitucionalización de los niños, para la desinternación de los niños. No vamos a hablar acá porque es otro tema y podría hablar mucho sobre el daño que la internación y la institucionalización y la privación del cuidado, de libertad, de, del cuidado familiar le hace a los niños, pero claramente ese es un eje de trabajo. Para ello se estableció una mesa interinstitucional de calle con organismos proveedores de bienes o con el deber de proveer bienestar, de protección social, vivienda, trabajo, salud, eh, consumo problemático de sustancias, todas las instituciones responsables de eso para pensar en dos ejes, cómo coordinar mejor la atención a las personas que se encuentran en la intemperie y por otro lado, cómo pensar mecanismos de prevención. Allí los actores más importantes son aquellos actores que, donde las personas viven antes de llegar a la situación de calle. Y para eso, en principio, y una de las cosas nos sirvió hacer este censo. Quería compartir esa experiencia con ustedes. Gracias. Thank you, Maya. Do we have any questions for clarification? Yes. Sí, son como dos preguntas. Bueno, va a tener dos varios. Eh, la primera es, si tú planteas que había dos de cada diez personas en tema, con temas psiquiátricos. No te entendí, perdón, no te escuché bien. Tú planteaste que dos de cada diez personas vivían con temas psiquiátricos. Dicen. Hicieron, hicieron algún censo específico sobre personas con discapacidad física y psicosocial. ¿O solamente tienen ese dato? Es la primera pregunta. Solamente tenemos ese dato. Wow, ¿Qué, es lo que, ¿Qué es lo que la persona declaraba? o el trabajador social, el técnico que, traba, que, que estaba haciendo la intervención, que era a ver, más de uno, este, presumía su claridad. Es decir, puede estar... Este... Eh, Mayra, esto en el micrófono. Ah, el micrófono. Sobre... ¿Ahí? Ah, en el micrófono. Sí, gracias. Eh, solamente tenemos ese dato y ese dato responde a lo que la persona declaraba y por otro lado, eh, responde a lo que en algunas circunstancias o lo que persona no lo declarara, el equipo que hacía el censo claramente lo identificaba, ¿no? Por algunos indicadores. Por lo tanto, no hay un censo de personas con discapacidad no. que vienen acá. En el Uruguay sí, pero no en, la, no en calle. Hay un censo de personas con discapacidad. Sí, sí, pero, pero no en calle. No, no, no. La, la otra es. Este, you need to need, you need, uh, uh, Tienes que usar el micrófono porque. Oh, que no, no te pueden traducir. Gracias. Bien, perdón, otra, los traductores, disculpen, no sabía, no tenía el micrófono. Este, la otra es la periodicidad del censo, o sea, cada cuánto, y si son datos abiertos que podamos consultar desde México. Eh, no, a ver, sí, sí no. Los, los datos, el censo se hace cada cinco años, pero... Te diría que la metodología utilizada en el último año es la que más va a permitir comparabilidad. Incluso quienes diseñaron la metodología pudieron visualizar otras experiencias en el mundo, tuvieron un taller con Volker que estuvo en el Uruguay, etcétera, para diseñar esto. Pero cada cinco años es lo que se ha hecho hasta ahora. ¿Y son datos abiertos? La base no es abierta porque está nominada. Este, los investigadores solicitan a las autoridades del ministerio la base denominada y ahí dependiendo de la intención de la, la intención en el sentido de la, la, la rigurosidad de la investigación que se plantea este, se, se, se brinda la base pero la, la base no es de consulta abierta 
Bueno, ahí debería... Se pide autorización y se, y se trabaja específicamente con la Dirección de Evaluación y Monitoreo para, para la autorización. Y la última, este, ¿hay un marco de ley que ustedes utilicen para donde esté sustentado el censo con presupuesto o no hay una ley o solamente fue...? No hay legislación específica para la presentación de calle, la legislación que hay es una, es una legislación este, más universalista eh, vinculada a las la leyes en general de diferentes temáticas de protección. Gracias. Thank you. So I'm Kimberly Schmidt from all Chicago, right here in Chicago. And wow. it's, um, it's an honor to talk with you all really about how we have looked at the Ending Veterans Homelessness Initiative. So what we've tried to do in Chicago is to end homelessness amongst our veterans. This has been an ongoing process. We're not done yet, but we hope to be there soon. And what I want to talk with you about today is where we're collecting our data, what it looks like, and how the leaders in Chicago have been able to use our data in a way to really understand what this problem looks like and to really make some effective changes as we get towards our goal of ending veteran homelessness. So here's what I'm going to cover during our time together. We're going to talk a little bit about our homeless management information system or what we call HMIS, that is the shared database that all of the homeless providers in Chicago use that helps us create a really complete depiction of everyone who's experiencing homelessness. So we feel our data is strong because we feel as though it captures every potential veteran who's experiencing homelessness. We also have worked to use that data to make sure that the data is comprehensive, relatable, Again, this is for our leaders as one of our main audiences. So we're going to talk a little bit about how we harness all of that information to make sure that we are able to put it into terms that are most useful to our leaders and, of course, to the wider community. Through that HMIS database, we're able to look at veterans as they go from becoming homeless and either engaging it with an outreach worker on the street or going into a shelter getting assessed and all the way through housing. So we're able to see what's going on with them at every step of the way from our first known engagement with them all the way to their entrance into housing. And we'll talk a little bit about our by name list. We know Community Solutions is here at our conference today and they have really spearheaded the work for every community working to end veterans homelessness and chronic homelessness to create a by name list. So we have a list of every veteran in Chicago. We know exactly who they are and a lot about them to obviously find them, connect them to housing, and to learn a little bit more about the work that we're doing. And this by name list has become a shared tool for housing, but also for rallying. So everyone wants to know how many are on our list, and they use that to help motivate the community. It's kind of like our barometer. We'll also be looking at our data dashboard we created a dashboard specifically for our leaders to help take some really sort of technical outcomes measurements and to put them into a way that's easy to view and then to obviously place into action. And then we'll talk about two instances where we've intersected data and leadership to resolve in planning. So we'll talk about two ways that that has helped to change our efforts. Oops. All right, so our homeless management information system, one of the things we did early on was to decide in Chicago that anything that we were going to do as far as collecting data was going to be in our homeless management information system, HMIS. So you can see from this depiction, it all sort of works together, that we have every the whole spectrum covered. We, as I mentioned, we have our shelters, our outreach workers, we have our... Um, everything from our permanent housing and right in the middle we have our coordinated entry process so that's really a coordinated way to connect everyone to housing that's all housed within the same database and we're really lucky too that our funders at the federal level have all really encouraged people to put data in here so our veterans administration we have our um, Department of Health and Human Services, they all have asked providers to put data in, so now we have one system to go to to really help show us what the issue is and to measure our success. 
So you can see I'm including a couple snapshots of what we've had to do. So we get these guidelines that tell us this is what we want you to measure. And then we get a lot of Excel data uh, worksheets that we look at. And so what we need to do is we can't share these measurements, guidelines, and we can't share Excel spreadsheets with our leadership team without them really having the best way to engage with that. So instead, what we've done is really pulled out what our benchmarks are that we're supposed to meet, and we clearly have helped try to define what we have to, um, to get to. So you can see on the right, the larger one is really boiling down what are these four criteria that we are striving to meet? And again, this is all from other guidelines and our Excel work. So you can see that what we're, one of the things we're supposed to do is end homelessness before our chronically homeless veterans. We're able to see we're not quite there yet. You can, it's very clear, yes or no, that is a no. And we're also trying to measure that any of our veterans who experience homelessness have quick access to permanent housing. And we've been asked to say in the past 90 days or three months, how long did it take veterans to get connected to permanent housing? You can see our numbers here. On average, it took 206 days. But we took that a little bit further to make it more meaningful. And we wanted to say of our veterans that are on that by name list that I referenced before, how long have they been homeless for? And we're seeing of all these veterans, on average, they've been homeless for 247 days. So this is a clear way to start showing that obviously we have an issue potentially with accelerating housing, finding appropriate housing, making sure it's available so that we can drop those down. We've been asked to get those numbers closer to 90 days. So you can see we're still greatly above that. We also are looking to make sure that we can see if we have sufficient permanent housing available for these veterans. And right now we just have a, a quick way to look at that. We're not there yet. We have to house more veterans that are becoming homeless. And you can see our latest data. We've had 281 veterans become homeless. We house 279. So we're not that far off, but it's still a no. And our last one is looking at something a little bit more complex. So I'll skip that for now, but it's what it's getting at our transitional housing usage for veterans. We've also flipped that again. So again, we want to make this easier. You saw our four instances there for our criteria. And then we've turned this into a large dashboard that our leadership team can engage with. So as I mentioned, we wanted to look at transitional housing. That's really difficult to engage for our um, veterans who enter programs that we call grant and per diem. It's transitional housing. And so what we can depict is where all our veterans are at in those providers and if they've had this offer of permanent housing and then if they've entered into that housing type as bridge, meaning they are going to go there and then we need to house them within 90 days or if they're telling us everything will be fine, they will take care of it on their own once they've gotten treatment. So again, it's a nice way to do it. It's an interactive dashboard too, so if any um, team member wants to drill down a little bit, they are welcome to do so. All right, so as I mentioned, in this system of data that we have for Chicago, we're able to really look at all aspects because it is a tool to housing. So I've in included a picture here. This is just an example of how within the database itself, we make referrals to housing providers. And our housing providers will be notified through our database that they have a match, as we call it, and then we will get updates from them about how the match is going. We can report out on that at any time. So if we know that our housing rate has slowed down, we're able to say where people are within this match process and what are any obstacles that are being reported. So for example, a little while back, we worked with our public housing authority. We saw that it was taking a long time for units to be inspected, for veterans to move in. They came, we all sat down at the table and they were able to accelerate the process and train some of our other staff members to do some of those inspections to at least make sure they'd be moving into a unit that would most likely be approved. And then you can see here our other picture. I don't know if you guys know, we are very proud of Chicago, of the Chicago Cubs winning our World Series last year. So our fake client happens to be Chris Bryant, who is the star. Um, good thing Chris is not really in our database, but we're using his picture now. 
And we're able to see here that he enters permanent housing. No one has to tell us we're able to see when it is, the type of program, and the date. All right, so I wanted to talk for a moment about that by name list that I talked about. Again, it is generated through our homeless management information system, turn, exported into our Excel document again that we use quite a bit, and then we do have some details for each of those veterans. We're able to see the total number of veterans experiencing homelessness, where each of those projects are throughout the city where they're at, and then any project history. So for example, if we have veterans who have been connected to our rapid rehousing model, which is a short-term subsidy provided within usually a community-based unit, if we know that that hasn't worked out a few times before, we don't want to match them there again. We want to see what that issue is. So we do have the history on that. And then how do we apply all that information? As I mentioned before, this is really our barometer for our, to assess our progress by looking who's on the list and if it's increasing or decreasing. And again, we, have, we can pull all of our outcomes from there. And then we can pull out subsets of our list to help share with our system integration teams that really start to look at how they can address certain issues, whether it's making sure that any veterans over 62 years of age have entered housing quickly, or making sure that our chronic homeless veterans are moving quickly through our system. And we use it a lot to start to talk about our inflow. That's the term that's being used to measure all of the veterans that are becoming homeless every month. So we do have our dashboard. And again, we one of the things that we have on our first page, and again, this is for our leaders to, because they have asked for this, but also for our wider community, is we look at the number of veterans currently experiencing homelessness. This is updated just last week. And you can see that we still have a ways to go. We had 574 veterans experiencing homelessness. And we're also able to look right again on that first page to see every month how many are becoming homeless of that group, how many are new to homelessness, meaning they're new to our system, or have returned to homelessness, meaning that we had them in our database as being previously placed in permanent housing. They have lost that housing option and now are returning to the system. And then right below, we can pair, compare with that the um, number that we're housing. And again, as you saw with our benchmark, we have to make sure that we're housing more than are becoming homeless. We're also able to see of all of those veterans that are on our by name list, where they're at as far as being matched. So we can see the different project types that are really working to um, accept those matches and house them, and we can and we can also see enrollment. So some t some programs will accept someone into their program, but then it takes quite some time for them to actually place them into permanent housing. And we can look at this, and I, well, I'll talk about this again soon. That we can see where there might be some bottlenecks or some issues within the system. If, for example, a little while back we had a project that was our supportive services and veterans families project that had a number of veterans referred to them and enrolled in their project, but they were housing the least amount of veterans. We could see that very clearly within our dashboard and could start to work with them to see what that issue might be. And then this last one that I'll show you right here is looking at, of all of our homeless <coughs> veterans, what projects are they in right now? So again, street outreach, emergency shelters, um, transitional housing on here as well, even some that might become inactive, meaning they haven't been in a program for uh, less than 90 days. And we can see how many have been assessed, how many haven't, how many have been matched as well. And then I can show you what that dashboard looks like. <coughs> so one of the things that we are um, we're actually really happy about is that we wanted to create some dashboards that can be interactive so our leaders throughout the community can actually zero in and pull the data that they need completely independently. So you can see here, this is what I was just showing you a picture of, we have our inflow and our outflow and we can measure, we can look back and how far we want to go and anytime we change the scale we can see the average and the total house. So this gives us a quick glimpse to see what is the scope of the problem right here. And then as I showed you before, 
we're also able to see where everyone is at. There it goes. And then what we've created is also at the bottom a way to look at each project and to break it down by there. So we have the sort of larger scale ways to look at data and more of the project level. And just to highlight a few more things, we're also able to look really quickly as close to live as we can who is actually housing our veterans. So this is for May, and again, this is current as of last week, and we can see what housing type they're being housed in, how that's been um, sort of a trending throughout the period of time that I have selected here, which is January 2016 until the present. And what we can also do is, again, if I mentioned that project was having some obstacles, we could see their housing over time by simply clicking on that project and seeing the trends. So again, this is something on a tool that we have available to help guide our leaders a little bit further. Okay, so I want to talk briefly about two ways that we've actually applied this data. And so the we were and I'm sort of correlating it with our dashboard as well. So as we mentioned before, we can see where all the veterans are at and what's, um, again, preventing us from getting to 90 days from identification of that they're homeless to housing. And you can see here, we still have a number of veterans in our Supportive Services for Veterans Families program. It's down to 147. But back in time, it was closer to 300 veterans that were in that, pro that project type. And that makes about, about six programs in Chicago. And so it seemed to be that if we were going to reduce veterans homelessness, we needed to support that project type. And so the leadership team was able to see this and decided that they wanted to take it upon themselves to house 300 veterans in 30 days, based on just the number of veterans that were awaiting housing. So what did that look like? they were able to be matched to each of these SSCF projects to meet with them individually to find out what was uh, might have been happening on the ground to prevent veterans from moving quickly into housing. They also were a bridge with data. I could see from our HMIS database that we had some data issues. They received dashboards for each project to meet with them and go over some of those issues because the question was, are they housing more than they're being reported or is this the issue? So again, data to house 300 veterans in 30 days. We didn't house all 300, but we got we housed quite a bit. And the other piece that I'll show you is that we have, I have listed on the bottom, the number of veterans that were in housing. And we there was a goal to say, let's support these programs again and bring our providers together, our landlords, and our veterans all in one place. So the leadership team created an event called Home for the Holidays. And the goal was to take everyone who we knew was already in a program that we could see from the data, bring in landlords that, had a, and that already had units that were checked, and to have the veterans there so that veterans could leave the event right there with a the lease signed and to move into permanent housing. So I think that was it. Yes. So that is all of the information on so far our work to end veterans homelessness, primarily using the work of our amazing leaders here in Chicago and helping prop that up with a little bit of data from our HMIS system. So while Volker comes up, do we have a quick uh, Question from anybody why we do the transfer. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I, I maybe I missed it, but but who pays for this system? <laughs> and who manages it? Because I, I think that is a um, in any country if you want to coordinate services like this, uh, there's big costs involved. Yes, um, I, nobody can answer this too. So this is so we actually. So the nice thing is, is that the Department of Housing and, and Urban Development has, which is sort of our federal agency that really helps to organize um, efforts to end homelessness. And so they have recommended to all communities to have a homeless management information system, and they also allow us to apply for funding to support that. So all Chicago is 
what we call the HMIS Lead Agency. We receive support from the Department of Housing and Urban Development to manage this database. And the beautiful thing is that we do not charge all of those projects to use the database itself. Because obviously having, I think HUD realized that having one place within a community to collect all the data is extremely valuable. So they were able to put it in and then we staff it and manage it and train everyone on how to use it. Yeah, so, so a follow-up question is about the training. So you train everyone that uses the database from the outreach workers to whoever on how to effectively, because I think your database is only as effective as the people inputting the data and I'm trying to, to make sense of it. Yes, you know, our users have grown. We started with about 300 users. We're closer to 800. It's a lot of training hours, but we do training and data quality as well. And, um, create that so right we can't tell our leaders that to use our data to make decisions if we don't believe that it's quality data okay hello everybody um, um, I prepared a presentation on the role of street homelessness because um, the title of the conference is ending street homelessness in your city and uh, the title of the, this session was originally uh, how to use data for measuring for ending street homelessness. So just uh, uh, some points of the of my presentation very shortly about my information background. Uh, why is homelessness measured? Uh, what's the role of street homelessness in EU countries? Uh, and how is street homelessness uh, measured uh, with some examples from different cities and from the homelessness stretch three weeks and then conclusions um, information background uh, I will not uh, go very much into detail at the last uh, the, the most uh, recent uh, network is a network uh, which is called <coughs> measuring homelessness in Europe which collects information from more than 25 countries uh, members of the European Union but also some uh, across the uh, download uh, information from uh, the links given there. Why is homelessness measured? Uh, I think there are quite a lot of different uh, uh, different aims for measuring homelessness. It might just be an indicator of social exclusion. You might measure the extent of urgent housing need of homeless people. You might just raise awareness of a pressing social problem. Uh, you might measure trends over time, how is it developing. Uh, you will uh, want to provide data on which groups are most affected. Uh, you might measure specific needs and problems. Uh, you might develop policies to alleviate and reduce or prevent homelessness for specific subgroups and uh, use the data to do informed policy making. Uh, you might want to measure the effectiveness and perhaps also unintended con effects of interventions and uh, one thing which census authorities are interested in you might want to cover the complete population in population censuses um, although those who are difficult to reach so very often we find data about homelessness in the or we uh, our census data are completed with uh, numbers of homeless people without any more information on this group specific information of course if ending homelessness is an aim of course, measurement is needed to provide uh, the evidence whether the aim is reached or uh, progress being made. In, Ger in, in Europe, the best example is probably the Finnish strategy to eliminate long-term homelessness, uh, which uses an annual housing survey showing the reduction and going towards uh, the new strategy now, uh, now including prevention uh, measures probably most near to a functional zero in Europe. There are quite few examples in Europe with the direct connection of a strategy to reduce street homelessness with measurement. Probably the most prominent is the Rough Sleepers Initiative, uh, first in London, then followed by the Rough Sleepers Unit, uh, and more recently by the London Initiative, No Second Night Out. They used uh, uh, quite a, an interesting tool. They use the chain database uh, 
which is uh, every outreach worker is uh, provided uh, with a palm and gives uh, in, uh, <coughs> information on the on the rough sleepers similar to, to what you described uh, for your database. There's also a street count in Dublin which is connected to uh, a strategy to, ra to reduce street homelessness. Um, actually, uh, the aim were, was not yet met. Uh, um, they have pointed time, the time numbers around 100 to 150 uh, persons. Um, street homelessness is the least controversial category of homelessness, uh, of homelessness typology, but there are astonishing few examples of national counts in Europe. Street counts are to be found more often in cities in the south of uh, Europe, like in Lisbon, in Barcelona, in Madrid, in cities in Basque Country, also some in Italy, but also in Brussels, in four large cities of the Netherlands, uh, or in Bratislava in the east uh, of Europe. Not all of these are recurrent counts, some are only one offs. Why is that? Why is street homelessness not so often uh, counted and measured in Europe? I think uh, it's also because street homelessness is quite a tiny proportion of the overall number of homeless persons in most European countries. In Ireland, for example, a rough sleeper census in April 2016 showed 127 rough sleepers all over Ireland. During one week of the same month, more than 4,000 people were registered in emergency services for homeless people. In a service-based count in one region in Germany, quite a large region of more than 80 million uh, inhabitants uh, of almost 21,000 homeless people in June 2015, only about 5.6% were registered as living rough. And in Barcelona, the 2015 homeless count uh, registered something like uh, almost 700 rough sleepers among 2,800 homeless persons on a single day. That's 25%, uh, but still uh, uh, a minority. Uh, we have a variety of approaches. Uh, in Brussels, for example, there is uh, every two years since 2008, uh, we have a one hour street count, only one hour to prevent uh, double counting, conducted by volunteers. In 2016, it was 160 people, and con combined with data on shelters, supported accommodation, squats. It involves NGOs, public authorities, police, local security services, religious communities, public transports, etc. But it only collects very limited uh, further information uh, except location, sex, estimated age, nothing else. People are not uh, woken up, they are just counted and looked at. Uh, we have in Bratislava a very uh, recent count, first home survey including a point in time count in November uh, 9th of 2016. They had four hours, they were counting in homeless facilities and on the streets. And they had a, a more ambitious questionnaire um, and it involved street outreach, outreach workers and volunteers, maybe students. And we have a very regular annual reporting in Barcelona, in Spain, where probably, which is probably the most advanced in Spain. Uh, the count in 2016 involved 800 volunteers. They used a mobile phone app, uh, and the data show that uh, the outreach team covers already about 75% of, or, or uh, uh, up to 85% of those counted in the point in time counts. For the Spanish people, it's, or for the Barcelona people, it's a, a reason to, to ask for more accounts, but uh, on the other hand, it's interesting to see that uh, outreach teams have, um, have uh, um, already contact to uh, the majority of these people. And then we have the uh, Homeless Registry Weeks, uh, which uh, some of you might know because they were also conducted in the US and uh, in Canada. Um, there was a campaign, uh, a pilot in 2015-2016, and I want to say some considerations of that. It's a specific approach following the exams from the US and Canada. It was conducted in two Spanish cities, in Valencia and Barcelona, and in two parts of London. Uh, in Westminster and Croydon. 
they used quite an extensive uh, questionnaire combined with the with the vulner with the vulnerability index, uh, which was also completed by volunteers. These are very different from the usual counts in the EU. Uh, at least these point in time counts, which are anonymous, as it collects names and detailed personal information on support needs and personal experiences. I actually have some ethical issues with this uh, type of counts. Um, it is okay. The questions are, is it really okay to let volunteers uh, collect quite sensitive information on the experience of violence, health issues, drug use, social relationships com combined with names? Um, is it okay to use a service prioritization decision uh, pre-screen tool with many questions if those collecting the data have nothing to offer and to decide? And shouldn't questions be reduced to the amount of information needed for immediate action? That are um, three questions I would put on the table uh, when discussing uh, this uh, method. Method. So there could be an answer saying that we should uh, divide uh, kind of a, a point in time counts with. Uh, uh, from um, this more sophisticated questions on personal issues which could be better done by professionals and by experts who are trained and uh, uh, who can do the job. <coughs> My conclusions, very shortly, um, data collection and homelessness may serve very different purposes, uh, reducing or ending homelessness only being one of them. In many European cities, street homelessness is only a small fraction of the total homeless population. For street counts, it is essential to cooperate with all local stakeholders. That's very important <coughs> to get all together. Um, a large number of volunteers are needed for this type of count. Uh, the recruitment, of course, helps raising awareness, uh, but engaging volunteers in collecting a, a, a lot of personal information might raise ethical questions. Where good outreach is organized um, by professionals, uh, they might already have good, good knowledge about the majority of those living on the street. Um, and there's a need to reflect on the extent of personal questions and the purpose of these. Although on how to, also, sorry, also on how to prevent creating a poorly deficit-oriented approach instead of one which is based on the strengths and resources of those living on the street. And counting and measuring vulnerability might better divide it into two different experiences, or different exercises, sorry. Um, ending homelessness requires access to housing and adequate support plus prevention and of course a local, regional, national strategy to provide the necessary resources rapid rehousing, housing first, etc. Homeless measurement is needed to raise awareness and measure progress in reaching the aim. It may inform about the, um, the support needs of homeless people and help <coughs> develop evidence-based policies. But ultimately, these policies are the most important factor required to ending homelessness. Of course, ending homelessness does not really lead to, uh, sorry, measuring homelessness does not lead to ending homelessness. You need the right policies for it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you to our speakers. And I think if you turn your mics on the, at your spots, uh, oh, let me take this one back. They're on. Okay. Uh, questions. I saw this hand first. <coughs> um, it's for Volker, actually. Um, my name's Lee um, Voss. I'm the Deputy Chief Executive of Volker Housing and Support in London. Um, I'm also the lead on the Croydon arm of the End, uh, the End Street Homelessness Campaign. Um, and it's not so much a question, it's more the offer to answer those questions. Yes. Because every single question that you raised, I could respond to robustly. Um, and I don't think now is the time, but just to highlight 
we will be giving a presentation on the Croydon arm of the European campaign tomorrow at one of the sessions. So if you want to hear the robust response to those, <laughs> those ethical concerns, um, you know where to find me. Thank you. Um, my name is uh, Fred Friedman. I'm uh, with an organization called Next Steps, organization of people with lived experience of homelessness, mental illness, substance abuse, or involvement with the justice system. And I have lived experience of severe mental illness and homelessness. Um, uh, this also isn't really a question, it's more of a statement, and it's uh, to my it's just actually beginning the discussion. So in your uh, presentation, you talked about 20% uh, of the street homeless as uh, having come from an institution uh, for mental illness. And then in one of the questions, somebody asked you, how many people have mental illness? And it's important to understand that those two sentences aren't the same thing. People can go to institutions of mental illness, hospitals or, or treatment centers, and not have a mental illness, or um, they can, not everyone who has a mental illness goes to uh, an institution. In the United States, for example, 20% of the population has uh, symptoms of uh, mental illness in any given year, only a, a very tiny percentage of that actually ends up in, in institutions. And uh, Volker had mentioned that uh, um, defining street homelessness only deals with a tiny proportion of, of people with, uh, uh, who are actually homeless. And that's fine, but if you're going to draw those differentiations, you have to be clear that you're not talking about the larger subset. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> I am Indu Prakash from uh, India. I have been working with the homeless uh, for the last 17 years. And uh, so my questions are uh, to all the three, in fact, uh, so one by one. Myra, in fact, uh, you know, uh, you uh, surely are a minister. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, first of all, I should really, really need to applaud you, you know, for the work that you're doing uh, in Uruguay. Um, my question really is that you know, uh, in India we face huge problems. Uh, one is about convincing ministers, and two is also um, for ministers to also make the bureaucrats work. So there are two problems, you know. So how is it that you've been able to work around getting them involved in this? That's one. Uh, then uh, you know, to uh, Kimberley, I think uh, first of all, I think great effort. I think uh, the MIs that have developed on veteran uh, homeless. I think it's interesting. Uh, your organization is called All Chicago, and how is it that you're focusing only on veterans? Why not all the homeless in Chicago? Because yesterday we went around, you know, and we saw homeless all across from Lincoln Park and various places, you know, and uh, we felt surely sorry because in India we are fighting against it. So I think he has an organization called All Chicago, and uh, maybe this, of course, there's a strategy to it. So we want to know the strategy as to why, you know, maybe. You know, cover it. So I think it's up to for you to just answer that. And walk, Walker, um, you know, uh, I remember. In fact, uh, you know, last time also I heard you speak, and fantastic to hear you again. Uh, you know, um, like we've had census happening every ten years in India, and uh, we have found as to how even when the government comes to do census, and in fact that was what Pu Mukherjee had referred in, uh, you know, in the last uh, you know um, uh, meeting that we had here. You know, uh, we have found how the census, especially in India, every decadal census that happens is actually a fraud. Hundreds and thousands of homeless are not even enumerated. Okay, and you have all the planning happening on the census data. So when you're talking of data, data collection, and the one you know point in time kind of data collection and all that, these are surely you know I think uh, pretty technical. And uh, with volunteers, we have found that I think it's, it's also, uh, we, if you get committed to volunteers, they work well. So how is it that you go about doing it, that we are able to handle some of these issues? I would want to uh, you know, answer that. Thank you. Myra, go ahead. If you, if you want to take your question, and then we'll go down the line. Um, sí. Al respecto de la pregunta sobre 
<risa> al respecto de la pregunta eh, sobre las personas este, que habían estado en instituciones mentales primero que el 20% lo que nosotros eh, en, en el censo se le preguntaba a la persona es si había estado en una institución vinculada a la salud mental nosotros de allí no desprendemos que las personas tengan un trastorno permanente de salud mental es claro que son cosas diferentes para nosotros Sí es cierto que eso es un indicador de que estuvo en alguna institución de protección social porque la mayoría de ellos pasaron por instituciones públicas vinculadas con la salud mental donde hay equipos interdisciplinarios que trabajan para la integración de las personas y para el acceso a las prestaciones y lo que nosotros podemos dilucidar de ahí es que el pasaje por esa institución de atención a la salud no logró incidir en que las personas pudieran acceder a prestaciones o quiero decir a soluciones habitacionales o a prestaciones monetarias entonces no, no hay, de allí no desprendemos una conclusión que diga que las personas tienen el 20% tiene trastorno de salud eh, mental ni tampoco que todos los que estuvieron en instituciones eh, de salud mental en todo caso tienen problemas vinculados con la salud mental problemas permanentes eso no, pero sí que allí, cuando las personas estuvieran en instituciones, se podría haber trabajado más asertivamente si esos trabajadores sociales, por ejemplo, hubiesen tenido recursos para solucionar los problemas de, este, de acceso a la vivienda de las personas. Y la asociación para nosotros entre discapacidad y salud mental está, no existe, es, es, está separ, conceptualmente son dos cosas diferentes. Claramente una persona puede tener un problema de salud mental y no tener una discapacidad. Al respecto de cómo convencemos a los burócratas o a los políticos, cómo trabajamos en eso. En forma teórica yo no tendría que convencer a ningún otro político porque el resto de las instituciones están gobernadas por personas de mi mismo gobierno que tienen un único programa de gobierno que hace cinco años votó la ciudadanía y decía, y el programa de gobierno dice que durante estos cinco años de gobierno hay que trabajar en algunos ejes prioritarios y el programa de gobierno, como todos, debe, es público, de conocimiento público y es un acuerdo político. Así que la prioridad de trabajar con la extrema pobreza y con la situación de calle de las personas, personas como parte de esa pobreza extrema o de esa exclusión debe ser una prioridad de todos. Cuando ese en algún momento por un problema de agenda o por un problema de escasez de recursos, los recursos no son infinitos, eh, cuando ese argumento podría no ser lo suficientemente fuerte, existe el argumento de costos. Una persona en situación de calle en el Uruguay eh, le cuesta más al Estado en términos financieros o probablemente le cueste más que si probáramos asignarle una vivienda, porque si hiciéramos un costo total de lo que hoy el Estado en todo caso invierte para darle algún alojamiento que solamente es nocturno, a las personas con alimentación, un equipo de trabajo, etc. Pero también lo que se gastan los accesos a los servicios de salud, los problemas vinculados a los salud, los problemas de seguridad, seguramente eh, prevenir el problema de situación de calle es más, más económico. Por otro lado, para nosotros el trabajo con las situaciones de desigualdad es un problema de viabilidad del, del país. Un país que permanece, en, mantiene niveles importantes de desigualdad no es viable en términos de desarrollo social. Entonces, por eso es una prioridad de gobierno trabajar con la desigualdad. To end veterans homelessness and all Chicago signed on for a few reasons first of all is that we want to end veterans homelessness for people that serve in the military they shouldn't have to live on the street or in a shelter the other piece of it too is that it was a way to test the work that we want to do as a whole for everyone in Chicago to see if we could create this successful coordinated entry system. So again, using one way to assess someone, determine their vulnerability, prioritize them, and connect them to housing. And I think what's been pointed out is that if as a community you can really 
have success in ending veteran in ending homelessness for one subgroup, then you can rally everyone around and say it's possible. If you can do it for veterans, then it's possible to do it for everyone else who needs to do so uh, within the rest of the city. Just a Just a short uh, question on the census data, the population and construction census in Europe in terms of measuring homes was mainly a failure as well. Um, uh, there were some countries really trying to, for the first time, to, con to conduct a, a real count. And, uh, but the, the, the main, what I wanted to say is that the main aim of statisticians uh, for a census is to have the complete population. Mm -hmm. They don't want to, to provide you with number of homeless people. Mm -hmm. They want to enlarge the mm -hmm. total number to the, to the real population. Uh, so in a number of countries we have, we have these extra surveys mm -hmm. uh, for homeless people, but then they were mixed together with people living in institutions, in prisons, uh, oh. in, uh, in other uh, types of unusual uh, 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 types of provision of accommodation and you didn't get a reliable number of the homeless people uh, and some numbers like from the UK were just unreliable so uh, this, uh, and to to uh, to invest a lot of effort in the next census which is in 10 years as well uh, from 2011 so it's uh, it's three or four years uh, I think is uh, is uh, a, a, a loss of efforts because uh, 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 in Europe, um, census will be more and more register-based, so it will be more and more difficult to get uh, an additional knowledge of homeless people. So I'm not very. Uh, I'm, I think separate counts and separate ways of trying to measure homelessness are more promising than doing it within the count, the population count. Okay, thank you. I have a question over here, and if you're English speaking, you will need your headphones. Bien, solo este, dos preguntas, bueno, una, dos preguntas. Una para Kimberly. Eh, hablaba que son 574 veteranos sin hogar y quisiera saber este, cuántas son mujeres y si encuentran diferencias entre lo que viven los varones respecto de lo que viven las mujeres ya estando en la calle. Este, bueno, o sin hogar, pues. Y para Volker, eh, el co Ha seguido varios censos en Europa y quisiera saber el costo, si lo tienen como más o menos desagregado. Entiendo que hay muchos voluntarios, pero aunque sea voluntario, eso, eso es un costo que se ahorra. Y si son impulsados por los gobiernos o, o son de coaliciones de ONGs quienes los promueven, esa es una. Y si dentro de, las, de los censos... O, o tienen alguna medición de las violaciones a derechos humanos más frecuentes que vive la población sin hogar, tienen alguna data, nada más. Y si los censos que tú, que ustedes han, han ubicado son, son datos abiertos, están en el mundo del open data, o, o son como lo que pasa en, en Uruguay, que es una data que tienes que solicitar permiso para acceder a ella. Nada más. So Kim, do you want to start? Yes, thank you for the question. Of, of our 574 veterans, we have seen pretty consistently either now or when our numbers were higher that about 98% of them are male. Mm -hmm. So that, um, you know, so some of the things that we're learning from this veteran population can't be directly expanded or generalized to a larger population because we know that the majority are male, a number of them are single, meaning no children, not, not any other partners. So um, what we've done is also try to change the housing stock. So some providers were saying that they had multiple units available within an apartment, and we've been really trying to say that we need those to fit our veterans right now, which are predominantly male singles. A lot of them do have disabilities, whether it's substance abuse, mental health, physical conditions. Um, and then we've also looked at age and their ability to really sustain independence to once they get into housing. I'm very sorry, but I almost can, can't answer any of these questions. I don't know the costs of... Uh, I said they use a lot of volunteers, like in Barcelona, 
but of course there is a, there is a budget for it and I can't tell you the budget. And the open data is uh, um, there, uh, you, you can't just use the data, but uh, for example for the Barcelona account they have uh, an English version and a Spanish version of course uh, of their results, but you can't uh, use the data. It's, it's published, but you can't, it's not open, open access. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Wayne, I'm, I'm from South Africa. Um, Volker, you already raised the issues of the ethical questions, and I, I, I want to acknowledge the importance of having data, because without proper data and appropriate data, we cannot lobby or advocate, reflect on our services and adjust and to see if we are really making an impact and a difference. But I'm struggling with the idea of, of a database, especially to people that are extremely vulnerable, such as people that are facing homelessness. In South Africa, we do not really have a comprehensive database of, of homeless people, um, and, our, and our census is not accurate because, I mean, as we all know, that counting people that are homeless is, is one of the most difficult things to do. Um, so many organizations and people, churches, have informal databases, but, but there is a calling for larger databases. They want a general database. But the problem, it immediately goes to, they wanted to do it through police services, to have police clearing. So, so suddenly, immediately it becomes, you, want, you must be drug free, you must be criminal free, you must be all of those things three, to be in order to be, to be helped, to be assessed, to be anything. So, my further um, issue that I have with the database, and, and I know in Pretoria we are moving towards it because we say we need to, to track the individual in order to have appropriate interventions, but the problem, it can become, easily become faceless people. It can just become numbers of, of people that we talk of. We just talk of generalized homeless people, and it's, and it's a them and a there, and a, and, and it becomes a very almost abstract thing, and it's not a, a real thing, a tangible thing. It becomes a very patronalistic way of approaching um, homelessness. And secondly, people that are homeless do not have privacy. I mean, if you are on the street, if you are facing street homelessness, you do not have privacy. Are we not infringing furthermore on, on the issue of privacy if we now almost, um, I mean, it becomes a forceful way of, of extracting all the information, they have no more parts of their life that is, that is um, private. So, so how do we understand it? And I, I'm asking this because I don't know how to think about this. I see the need, the utilitarian need for it, but I also see the dangers in almost this, this way, this new liberal way of thinking about uh, approaching homelessness in this way. Because in, in our, our organization, we we say we need to do it through relationships because most homeless people are, you'll find a lack of relationships. Families, whatever um, it, it may be. And the list contributes to a lack of relationship because through a list or database you cannot have a relationship with, with anyone. So, so my question is, is, I need to help to be, how do I think about this databases? I, I really don't know. Can I, uh, can I just add? Uh, I think it's. It, it, I, of course, I'm a researcher, and I also think for uh, for service provision, you need good data. It's more the question of who counts which data, uh, and I'm a bit suspicious of volunteers uh, counting a lot of uh, very personal information. And the other thing is, which data are used for which purposes, or needed for which purposes? Is it uh, okay to, to ask people a lot of questions if you don't have something to offer? I mean, if you, if you have something very specific, specific program going on, and you want to, to choose who gets a uh, profit of the program, that's completely different. But if you have a general questionnaire with 30 questions about uh, all, all different types of vulnerabilities without having something to offer, I think it's problematic. I just wanted to add also um, a response to the question. So I think it's, you know, I liked to show our dashboard that we're very proud of, but I think that one thing that I didn't show was how much effort 
went into designing the best way to collect the data that goes into the dashboard. So within our community, we created a, a consent form. And so it took great efforts from a cross section of our providers and we had some technical assistance to create a consent form that was designed in a way so that anyone experiencing homelessness could have the right to protect their information. So I think that's something that we don't take lightly. It's that just because you don't have a home doesn't mean that you don't have the right to say how your data is collected or shared. And so I think that having that consent is really something that we're even more proud of than something that looks nice as a dashboard to show that. And the, the data that's collected is all, I think that was one of the concerns is if you're collecting data, does it have a gain? And it does have a gain. The gain is to ultimately end homelessness, but to collect the data that we need to continue to have the necessary funding come into the community and to find the right housing. So continued, like the combination of protecting data, giving people the ability to make an informed decision about how it's shared, and to continue to get the resources that we need is really the reasons why we have this database. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm also from South Africa. Human Sciences Research Council has a project that uh, did a large homeless study in 2007, I think. And we have a small one going now in, in Maracana. I wanted to raise, maybe from that standpoint, some of the, the issues that we've been getting. Um, for Kimberly, one thing that just struck me is you seem to be having great success getting the veterans into the program and through the program. Um, I remember when we were reading up on this, we were looking at the stuff in San Diego, and they had quite a large um, group of resistant veterans who just weren't having any. You know, they didn't like what was being offered to them and they weren't getting off the streets. And um, I think probably with better targeted programs you could, you could get a lot of those people, but maybe not all of them. And then not everybody is going to, to go along with something like this. So I just wondered if you would comment on how you dealt with people who weren't really very keen to go through the system at all and you know, had another idea. Okay, that's one thing. Uh, we've got a couple of others. Um, also, we're hearing about the European surveys which seem to be you know, well, they have their problems, but they're very intensive, and you're likely to pick up. You've only got a few people that are homeless, a large number of people, huge amount of money. Um, if you look at this from the standpoint of, of, say, countries in Southern Africa, probably a lot more homeless, not very much money. Um, very difficult to see how you're going to pick up data at all. We had a lot of trouble, and I think a lot of it came down to what was mentioned earlier by Falker, some of the best data that's been collected was collected in Cape Town using people who had intensive relations. So this time when, when we looked in Rustenburg and Maracana, we also went through the community workers. And you do get better contact that way, but you can't go very far sideways. You can't get a very large sample that way. So now we've got qualitative data instead of quantitative data. A lot of insight, not easy to deal with it. Um, okay, so now this all comes through to the issue of how do you end homelessness in places that can't afford to do all this? And a lot of the programs that we're hearing about throw huge amounts of money in, you know, and then there isn't enough money to go around in the developing world. Uh, Rustenburg has been collecting data on homeless people for years, keep telling the homeless people, yes, we're trying to do something for you. Um, nothing ever happens through the official delivery programs, and South Africa has very major delivery programs for housing for the people who don't have good housing. They never get to the homeless, because the homeless are the last group on the list. They can't exist any pressure, exert any pressure on the bureaucratic process itself. Other groups who are also poor get all the housing. You know, the poor have not got any housing in that area. And now um, it looks like they're going through informality in a very interesting way, which we'll be talking about maybe later today or tomorrow. Um, okay, but I think those are all issues. There's just one last problem that I wanted to bring up, which is sort of tangential to the rest. We tried quite hard to get ideas on not only how many homeless people we had in the country, we didn't do all that well at it, but how, much, how many people were dying on the streets? What was the end of homelessness if you didn't get into housing? We can't get it. Nobody records street deaths. There is not such data. It's completely anonymous. You die on the streets, you die. End. Nobody knows you died on the street. Um, what about the problems with data collection? You know, are we getting the right data? We're taking this stuff off the census. We know it's not accurate. Um, what do we do? You know, I would be interested in hearing all of you comment on this. 
Okay, Myra, I would love to comment on your stuff. What I understood of it was brilliant. I didn't get the translation through. Your Spanish is so clear I could follow about half of it, but I daren't phrase a question. We might speak later. Okay, we have one minute left, so um, if the, obviously there are people that have many more questions, and this is a very important topic, so you know who the panelists are and the people in the room. I would encourage you, and I know that you'll have an opportunity to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with people, but if the panel can just respond to this very quickly, that would be great. A quick response to the questions. First of all, I know there's a lot of talk about census. We do also do some point in time counts in Chicago. But what we've also been leaning towards is our list, our by name list, as a more accurate way to gauge those that are experiencing homelessness. And then we have to make sure it's quality. In regards to veterans moving through programs quickly or not, it's a long, that would be a long answer. But I can say that having veterans on staff at certain projects has been very helpful and also making sure that we're addressing some of the needs for community so not having apartments by themselves but also within projects where you're allowing for support has really seemed to be helpful for some as well okay please join me in thanking our panelists thank you everybody